Hello everybody, and welcome back. Lately, my aluminum air battery videos have all explored a particular concept. Like, can I increase its performance using a catalyst? Or can I increase its durability using a solid electrolyte? With all those concepts, it's been a while since I've actually posted a video showing a complete battery. Well, that all changes today. In this video, I'm going to be showcasing my latest complete battery. It brings together a lot of the improvements that I've been investigating over these last number of videos. And it puts them all together into this 3D printed package. You could call it my aluminum air battery 3.0. In addition to a new battery, I've also been quite busy making something else. For the past six months, I've been putting together an online course about, you guessed it, aluminum air batteries. I made this course based off of my previous three years experience making battery videos for my YouTube channel. Not only does it cover content explored in my YouTube videos, but it also gets into topics that didn't make the cut or were made exclusively for this course. For my longtime viewers, you may remember when I posted my first video on my YouTube channel about aluminum air batteries. I said that I had been interested in them for a number of years up to that point, but had found that there was not a lot of good resources available for them. Now, since I posted that video going on about three years ago, it seems like the number of resources available for this type of battery has grown quite a bit, which is awesome. My goal for this course is that it can continue to add to the list of available resources for this pretty cool battery chemistry. If you're interested in checking it out, the link for it is in the video description. So back to my aluminum air battery 3.0. What's so great about it? Well, as you can see, it has this really slick 3D printed housing. This is of my own design and it comes in two variants. The variant featured in this video uses salt water and a weak alkali as an electrolyte. The other variant is designed exclusively for my course and it's a dual electrolyte design that makes use of a biopolymer gel electrolyte that I also designed myself. Besides the new 3D printed housing, this battery also uses a graphite sheet treated with manganese dioxide nanoparticles to act as a catalyst. Now I've already explored catalysts like this in previous videos in greater detail, so you can check those out if you want more information on them. For the variant featured here, this guy that I'm holding in my hands, we're going to get about one volt out of him with a peak milliamp output of about 70 milliamps. My dual electrolyte variant comes with the added benefit of increased shelf life and reduced corrosion on the aluminum foil, and it also puts out 1.2 volts with a peak milliamp reading of 150 milliamps, which I thought was pretty cool. Now I know what you're thinking at this point. How do I build this for myself? Well, that's what we're going to talk about right now. As mentioned earlier, I'm using graphite sheet as the cathode. To get my catalyst of manganese dioxide nanoparticles, I'll be using potassium permanganate, and as a current collector, I have stainless steel mesh. For the anode, I have regular aluminum foil, and the electrolyte will be a saturated solution of salt water and baking soda held in floral foam. For the housing, I've got a link in the video description for the 3D model. I'm using regular PLA, and besides the 3D printed parts, I'm also going to need four M3 by eight bolts and nuts. All the housing pieces are quite fine detail, so it's a good idea to print them with the smallest layer height you can. I use 0.16 millimeters. There's some stencils required as well for cutting various materials for the battery, and they can be printed with regular settings. I used 0.2 millimeters. With everything printed, I'm going to use my stencils to cut the various battery materials to size. I can use this flat one here to cut my graphite sheet, stainless steel mesh, and aluminum foil. It might be a good point to mention. I source my stainless steel mesh from cookware like this. Cut all these materials to the size of the stencil, except for the aluminum foil, which will have a longer end piece than the others. With 
With these materials cut to size, use a small screwdriver or similar tool to poke out both outside holes on the stencil for both the graphite sheet and the stainless steel mesh. At this point, I'm going to treat my graphite sheet with potassium permanganate to get those manganese dioxide nanoparticles onto it. Next, I'm going to use the other stencil with a raised edge to cut out some floral foam. I simply press the raised edge side into the foam and use a razor blade or other cutting tool to cut the foam to the shape of the stencil. All that's left now is to make my electrolyte. Into 100 milliliters of water, I'm going to add 20 to 25 grams of table salt and 5 to 10 grams of baking soda. Then I'll stir it until it's mostly dissolved. Now I'm ready to assemble everything. To do this, I'm going to start with my cell body and we're going to put the bracket retainer onto the back of it like this. This is just going to slide into place depending on how good your printer is. The tolerances might be pretty tight or pretty loose, but this is a pretty snug fit. To avoid it falling off for whatever reason, we're going to hold it in place at the back here with one M3 by eight bolt and nut. It's a good thing to note that there's two uh, important sides to the cell body. The side with the intent here is the cathode side, and that's where we're gonna place our cathode bracket and the opposite side, which is flat, is the anode side, and that's where our anode is gonna sit. We're gonna set this aside for now, and we're gonna move on to our cathode bracket. We're gonna take our stainless steel mesh and our treated graphite sheet, and we're gonna place them into this bracket with the stainless steel mesh in first, so that when we install it, it's not going to readily come in contact with the battery electrolyte. There we go. I take closer care here to make sure that these holes are lined up with the cathode bracket holes. I'm going to start with one M3 bolt and we're gonna put this through a hole like this and that's gonna hold everything together. go and then we're going to load this into the cell body I'm going to load this bracket onto the cell body by wedging the bottom of it into the cell body retainer and then folding it down lining up the center hole now it is normal these components will be a little on the loose side and that's normal until we get the rest of the battery put together with this somewhat in place, I'm going to secure it with this bolt here that we started and I'm going to install one more nut on top of this M3 bolt. Next up, I'm going to take my electrolyte here and I'm going to soak my floral foam with it. It's better to do it this way than to try to pour it on as it takes a little bit for the foam to absorb it. We're just going to do this until it's Got a decent amount in there. And now we're going to load that into our cell body. And if we've done everything properly, it should be a near perfect fit, like so. Now we can go with our aluminum foil on top. We're going to place that just over top of the 
floral foam. And then we're going to put our anode bracket on in the same way that we put on the cathode bracket. I'm just going to wedge it into place and fold it over. Now we're going to install these cell, uh, the side brackets and that's going to really start holding everything together. During this phase I may get a little bit of electrolyte leaking out as the floral foam is compressed a little bit more. And as you saw there, sometimes it takes a little bit to press everything down. So just be careful not to put too much strain on the edges of the side brackets and uh, we should be good to go. Now there is one more thing that we want to do here, and that is install two more M3 bolts here. And the reason why we're going to do that is that's going to serve as our connection terminals for the positive and for the negative. And there we have one finished battery cell. As you already saw at the beginning of this video, this battery puts out one volt and 70 milliamps at its peak. I wanted to get an idea of how it performed under load, so I decided to see how it did with an LED. LEDs need about five volts to run. So to get the voltage up, I made two cells, wired them in series, and connected them to a homemade jewel thief. It struggled to get the required voltage, so it started off pretty dim. But once it got there, these cells had no problem keeping the LED going. It drew about 3 milliamps and was still going strong after 10 minutes. I feel that I should have made another one just to get the voltage up, but I guess in the next video I make, I'll just have to power something bigger. So that brings me to the end of this video. I'm quite excited with how this battery has turned out and with how this project has progressed as a whole over these last couple of years. If you've enjoyed this video, a like and a comment is always appreciated. And as usual, I have the links for everything I talked about in this video, including the course that I just finished making in the video description. So you can check those out if that's something you're interested in. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I'll see you in the next one. MGR signing out.